Hello, Port Washington families. This is Michael Hines, proud superintendent of schools for the Port Washington School District. Thank you for joining me as I um, have this pre recorded uh, message. And um, we're going to go through our reopening plan. So I appreciate you taking the time to do so. Before we get to the plan itself, um, I want to have a few people to thank. I want to thank the Board of Education for all of their tireless, tireless work. I want to thank um, our administrators, certainly our teachers and other staff members who were part in creating this plan, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, I want to thank you, our community, for being as patient as you have been. I know these are very difficult times. I know there's some anxiety, um, actually a lot of anxiety with the return to school. I mean, every time you pick up a newspaper, there's a new story about what's happening in a, in a school district outside of New York. Um, so I want to hopefully this this conversation, and this presentation will uh, alleviate some of the, the fears that you may have, and it will certainly cause you and rightfully so to have questions. Um, the purpose of this presentation is to just share some of this information with you on Monday. Uh, as you know, we will have a Board of Education meeting uh, that's been rescheduled a few times because of the power out outages here in Port Washington. And there we'll have a live conversation uh, with our Board of Education and the board will ask um, really important questions. And you'll have the ability to ask questions later after the board meeting at our town hall meeting. And I'll talk about that process in a little bit. So why don't we pull up the presentation and we will start. Um, unpacking this. It's around 39 slides. Um, if I time this correctly, it should take about 25 minutes or so uh, to go through this. And again, we will go a little more in depth um, on Monday when we meet at our Board of Education meeting. So first and foremost, um, as a superintendent, I believe our reopening plan uh, should have two goals in mind. First, a physical school environment it has to embody public health guidelines to prevent a COVID-19 outbreak and additional closures. We don't want that. Nobody wants that. So such planning requires significant changes to our physical spaces. And uh, I want to be very clear about that. Transportation plans, our calendar and schedules, we have to contact trace our capabilities in doing so. And of course, this is all done in partnership with uh, and under the guidelines of the Department of Health and the CDC. And second, our plan must produce enough confidence that our poor Washington families, our students and staff feel ready for face-to-face -face teaching in our schools. Communication with all stakeholders is key for this to be successful. Now, it is recommended by Johns Hopkins School of Education and the Institute for Education Policy. They recommend prioritizing elementary schools their, their students for academic, social, emotional um, growth. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Not to say that secondary students, we shouldn't focus on that, but there's a real push to make sure um, we have that contact time face-to-face uh, -face, and we'll talk about that shortly because there are real emotional benefits uh, of having that physical proximity uh, to their peers and to their teachers. So for that, let's let's move to the second uh, slide. And so when we talk about reopening plan goals, we're really focusing on now from a district wide perspective, provide for the health and safety and wellness of students and staff and families. And to ensure, of course, the ongoing delivery of quality education at all grade levels. Now, we learned a lot and we certainly heard from our community and our staff um, that what we did in the spring needs to be upgraded. And I believe very much so that we hit the mark with that. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So our next slide focuses on our guiding principles as we develop this plan. Of course, we have to maintain student, staff, and community health and safety. That is priority number one. All of this means nothing if we don't really focus on the health and safety of our students and our staff and, and what that entails. And again, this plan will unpack that. We have to promote continuity and excellence of instruction, of course, and that's something that 
we had in the forefront of our minds as we were developing our plans. We have to ensure access and equity for all of our students. And I think we addressed that. And I'll talk about how, especially when it comes to technology and our new one-to-one -one initiative, which I'm very proud of. Meet the needs of all students and families. And then finally, develop plans that are within district budgetary limitations. And there are limitations um, when it comes to the budget. Um, that's any budget, but ours in particular. So we had several committees that were formed um, as we developed this. And when we talk about who was part of the plan that we created, you have to understand there were over 100 committee members that were representing stakeholders from all parts of our school community. That would include district office, building administration, and our directors, our teachers from pre-K through 12, 12th grade, buildings and grounds, our custodians, transportation, our tech staff, physician, school nurses, psychologists and social workers, paraprofessionals, our office staff, law enforcement, and then, of course, our parents and our Board of Education trustees. They were all part of it. And when you look at the different subcommittees that met, you are seeing that they were broken up into health and safety, special education and mental health. We're talking about transportation and food services and what that means. We're also focusing on communications. Clearly, I, you know, as much as the fireside chats are helpful, and certainly that happened before the pandemic, it is incredibly important that we continue that um, in, in a much more robust way. So you are up to date with everything that is happening within our schools in, in, in multiple modalities. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So we also broke it up our subcommittees into individual building protocols. Uh, and then finally, we had an instructional component as well, um, as we'll, we will outline in a few minutes. So in order, and we, we anticipate the governor um, making an announcement tomorrow as far as the reopening of schools, but there, there is certain criteria. And right now, our region is in phase four, which is great news. And... COVID-19 regional infection rate is below 5%. That certainly helps as of now uh, for us to reopen. But again, we will wait until see what the governor says. So currently, right now, Long Island meets both criteria. Now, there is a timeline. Now, this timeline has changed a little bit since this afternoon. Um, and I'm speaking right now, and it's Thursday, and it's August 6th. Um, and it just shows you it really is... Uh, it's amazing how, as we are developing not only the plan and even the timeline, but things shift and they change at the last minute. And we have to be prepared for that this year. There will, there will be lots of changes, I, I believe, and we have to be able to pivot very quickly. As you notice the, uh, on the left hand uh, side of uh, this timeline, you'll see we started uh, reopening committees and, and the meeting started to take place in June and July. On the 13th of July, uh, there was guidance and there was a checklist that was issued. Now, it certainly would have helped school districts if we received this important uh, information well before July 13th. And then we had all school districts had about two weeks to develop a plan to then submit to the state. And so, as you see, for July 31st, they were submitted to New York State. That was last Friday and to the state education department. Now, August 1st through 7th, and then we, we know it's going to be tomorrow, so it's really the 7th, uh, the governor is announcing uh, what's going to happen with the reopening of schools, as I said before. Um, we were scheduled to have a Board of Education meeting on the 6th, as you can see, but now we're going to um, move that to Monday, as I said before. Um, now, with that, there is an online parent survey and questions, and after this is posted, uh, this uh, recording, um, you will see on our website a link for you, our, our parents, um, to, to ask questions as far as after this plan. And you can submit them, what your questions are. We will collate that information. And then we will look to have a virtual community town hall to answer those questions um, on August 11th, uh, which is Tuesday at 7 p.m. Before that, I, I will be addressing our staff in a virtual staff meeting um, starting around either 3.30 or 4 o'clock. It says 3.30 here, but we may change that. 
Uh, and then finally, what's really important for us, and I'll talk about why, is the results of the parent survey. Um, again, that is hyperlinked here and will be on, in the presentation and will be on our website. We need to know certain information as we continue to um, develop our plans moving forward. So here's a qualifying statement. This is something that was really one of our guiding lights as we were developing our plan. The district's plans are based on the most current guidance, and we know that from the CDC, from the New York State Department of Health. We work very closely with the Nassau County Department of Health. And as these guidelines change, and they will change, um, they've changed many times over the past several months, we will need to make necessary revisions in our plans and, of course, then inform our community uh, where we are making those revisions. So, you know, I have to be careful because I keep saying, like, this is important, this is important. And listen, ultimately, everything we're talking about in all of these slides are incredibly important. But I can't think of anything aside from the safety of our students. And of course, our staff is the caring for <clears throat> our students' emotional and social needs. This is something that is not only important, but we have to understand that there have been so many challenges for our families, economic challenges. Many of our students have been socially isolated. Um, we may not think that's necessarily true as we walk around town and we see people in restaurants or at the beach. But believe it or not, we do have many of our students, and I will say our staff too, who um, are isolated in many ways where they were never isolated before. And so we have to recognize that the, the social well-being of our students, how this is incredibly important uh, moving forward. And what we also have to think about is um, trauma. And some of our students um, have been affected uh, just by how serious this pandemic is, it, you know, as we talk about the different challenges. And so there's something called um, the ACEs study. I won't get into it right now, into the particulars, but it's the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. And it talks about trauma in depth. And some of the things that we can do, I believe, um, as a school district to help combat some of those difficulties that our students may be experiencing. So the good news is we are focusing on staff professional development. Um, as we continue um, this, this new way of educating our students and this what schools look like and just how everything has changed so radically from last September uh, with the first day of school, we have to focus on professional development in, in a myriad of, of different ways. Um, so we will be doing that and we have to identify our students and staff that needs assistance and support because we will have that. And so that is critical as we move forward. A range of services review. So we have to increase the availability of district counselors, social workers and psychologists for a consultation with students and families. You know, we have to be very aware of the local agencies that we will lean on and rely on such as Port Counseling or the North Shore Children and Family Guidance Center, um, the Hispanic Counseling Center. There's a whole um, slew of wonderful organizations within our community or around our community that we will need to lean on uh, as we move forward. So protecting the health and safety of our students, our staff, and our families. Um, this is a big charge for us, and we take this very seriously. So we're going to showcase some of the things that we are, we will be doing as we move forward. So staff online affirmation, which means there's a, a slew of questions that staff will have to answer before they enter. Uh, our buildings, and it's like a checklist. And so we have to make sure that we follow these protocols. So we, we make sure that they're symptom free and they don't come to our buildings. Um, and we have a whole set of protocols, which we will talk about in depth on, on Monday. But 
please know that anybody who works within our schools before they enter, they will have to um, go through a checklist to make sure that they are okay. There's a student health screen at home. We are relying on our, our parents to make sure their, the temperatures are taken of our kids before they come to school. So we wanna make sure that um, you know, if your child has uh, a temperature of 100 degrees or more, um, they, they're not permitted to come to school. Now, there, there are certain things that we will do within our school to take temperatures of, of our students. We will have uh, those electric uh, thermometers, um, you know, the scanners to, to make sure our students um, and, and, their, and their temperatures are taken. And we'll talk about what some of those protocols are, but you know, for, for what's incredibly important is that we as a school district have to work together with all of our families. And this is something that we are asking our families to do to ensure that your child doesn't have a temperature before they come to school and it's less than 100 degrees. Now, if we find out, you know, a student is, has a high temperature in school or our staff members, we have an is isolation rooms in each of our buildings. So students or staff members who present, you know, COVID-19 symptoms will be escorted to a designated isolation room where the school nurse will assess them. The siblings of isolated student will also be assessed as well because we, these are things that we have to follow and we take that very seriously. Now, when we look at classroom protocols, the, the social distancing is critically important. And I know there are questions out there and not just here, it, you know, the questions of how do you keep students, children, especially young children, socially distant? And it's not easy to do. And we'll talk about some of the things that we're doing uh, to make sure that does happen to the best of our ability. But masks and face coverings are required. They are required for all our students and staff. Masks will be provided by the district, but staff and students are encouraged to really bring their own to school. And uh, the coverings, they have to be worn over the mouth and nose at all times. Now, if there are medical reasons, clearly we will have to work with the families and, uh, and, and make sure um, we're following those best practices uh, for medical reasons. Um, but the masks are really, really important. And I just want parents to understand this is, again, something that we take very seriously. The social distancing in the classrooms. So all classrooms will and instructional spaces are being and they are redesigned to maintain social distancing of six feet. That means desks and they have to be desks. They can't be tables will be six feet apart. Uh, and I'll, well, I'll talk about what the classroom will look like in, in a few minutes when we get to the, the instructional component. But then we have to have mask breaks. And um, that's incredibly important for our students and for our staff. I don't know if you ever worn a mask for six hours straight. Um, not easy to do, that is for sure, especially for our little ones. Um, but we have to you know, make sure that we are keeping our kids socially distant. But we also, when they're eating lunch, clearly they'll have their masks off. Um, but they have to have breaks as well. And so when we have those breaks for our kids, you know, they won't be within six feet of each other so they can do that. And we'll have regularly scheduled breaks throughout the day. So continuing along the lines of health and safety, um, hand washing is one of the most important things we can do. And we will not only make sure that we provide soap and warm water uh, for our students um, and we'll talk about protocols we're going to make some videos for our families so everyone's on the same page everyone's speaking the same language so to speak as far as what the expectations are for hand washing but we also purchased 25 portable sinks as well and they will be installed throughout the school district we are enhancing our cleaning and disinfecting so that means areas that are touched often um, will be consistently cleaned uh, with school appropriate disinfectant. And we will also have additional training uh, for our staff as well. Drinking water access, you know, drinking fountains, you know, where, where there's bottle filling stations, um, that is the only permissible way to, to uh, refill a, a bottle. But, you know, we, we strongly encourage that students bring their own water um, to school. The, the, the water access, um, you know, concern is something that we have heard over and over again, cannot drink out of a drinking fountain and again, only permitted to use um, those areas as with the bottle uh, filling stations. 
So continuing with health and safety, <clears throat> we're looking at building protocols still. There has to be signage, proper signage, um, really embedded throughout all of our schools. And so all of our buildings will, will have uh, instructions and, and, and signs uh, supporting the healthy practices, not only for hand washing, but in respiratory hygiene, but um, just how to walk up, you know, or in the hallways and up and down the stairs. And so you'll see the next bullet point is directionals on walls and floors to maintain appropriate flow of traffic and social distancing measures. Now, for those of us who watch the news often, right, I think it was a picture even today of a school in high school in Georgia, and it's a picture of high school kids in the hallway crowded walking through, and I believe they didn't even have masks on because they weren't required. Not the case here in New York and certainly in Port Washington. And so we have to be very aware of um, just normal human behavior to want to get close to each other, to speak to each other. You know, it's a lot of these things are counterintuitive and we have to um, just make sure that we're on top of, you know, making sure kids are socially distant in, in, our, in all of our schools. So ventilation, this is something, you know, again, in our attempt, and I think I'm very thankful uh, that we're doing this to be proactive, we're installing 300 HEPA air purifiers throughout classrooms and buildings in the district for enhanced air filtration. And of course, we're opening the windows. Now, there are areas within our school um, that don't have, you know, uh, either the proper ventilation or uh, ventilation that it needs to be enhanced and certainly we will be placing our HEPA filters uh, there um, and air purifiers, I should say, uh, in, in those locations. But every single classroom will also have a HEPA, HEPA filter air purifier. Now our bathrooms, the access will be monitored to ensure social distancing. So at the building level, we will have protocols and procedures for that. We are exploring the option of utilizing tents for outside space. We and we'll talk about space issues in our schools, like all schools, um, especially if you're bringing all students back or even half the students back at our secondary levels. Um, it's not easy to do. So how do we actually maximize the outdoor space that we have? Not only is it good for kids to be outside and certainly for our, our adults, um, but we can use them as uh, instructional places of, of learning, um, whether it's for music, whether it's for physical education and or just bringing groups of students out. So we are exploring that and um, we'll have more information hopefully by Monday as far as where we are. So continuing with health and safety, we're also looking at transportation protocols. Part of the survey that um, I'm hoping that you take as, as a parent um, allows us to know how many uh, parents are going to send their children uh, to school on a bus. Now we are revising our bus capacity. The bus capacity um, on a typical school bus is 66 students. But because of social distancing, and we are again taking this very seriously, we are not allowing more than 22 students on the bus so we can properly socially distance. Now, you may hear of other school districts that may have all 66 kids on the bus, 44 kids on the bus or, or more. Uh, we're being extra cautious with this and we're going to make this work as far as our bus routes and the number of buses we had. So we are, um, we do have additional bus routes uh, that we're incorporating to accommodate, you know, this revised bus capacity. Um, and then of course, while a student is on the bus, a child's on the bus, they have to wear a mask and they are required to, to wear it. The bus driver will also wear a mask as well. And so um, I'm happy to report that we'll have, you know, we're, we're really adhering to uh, being socially distant on the bus and more to come on uh, the health and safety of our kids on, on our buses, but it will help us tremendously. Like I said before, if you let us know in advance, um, if you plan to send your, your child or children to school on the bus. So now we talk about instructional options. And as you know, within our plan, all school districts were uh, required to send uh, three different types of plans. So we'll go to the next slide and I'll just briefly outline that again. Oh, actually, I'll be, I think, the next slide. But before I do that, let me talk about the primary goals. Of course, the, the major goal is to return as many students as possible to a full time in school scheduling while remaining, you know, in compliance again with CDC guidance and certainly the Department of Health 
um, and uh, SED, the State Education Department. But we want to provide every port student with a computing device to directly support their instruction through one through our one-to-one -one initiative, which I'll, I'll talk about in a few minutes. So with the, the different options that are available right now, um, and again, all this is dependent upon what, what, what the governor says tomorrow, but in-person, just so again, we're all on the same page here, in-person instruction means in uh, instruction for 100% of our students in the building itself. If we're looking at a hybrid, it's a combination of in-person instruction and on the flip side of that is remote learning, um, which we all have experience with, with what happened uh, from March uh, through June. And um, remote learning for all or a defined group of students. And then finally, for fully virtual, um, which is what we did experience, was the full virtual part. That's 100% remote learning. At any point throughout the year, we could pivot and go from a hybrid to fully virtual back to hybrid to fully virtual. It's incredibly important that our schedules and what we have are fluid. So it's not confusing to the student, not confusing to the parent or the educator. And I think, um, actually I know our committees did, I think a tremendous job in doing so. So here's where we are at this moment with our instructional options. At the elementary level, what we are doing is um, the elementary building footprints and the building capacities permit return uh, of all our elementary students to full time in school schedule and still maintain social distancing requirements. Now, what's what's important to know is that at the secondary level, because we don't have the space to bring everybody back and to make sure we are socially distant. Um, we, we just couldn't meet those requirements. As hard as we tried, um, we just don't have the physical space to do so. So Weber and Schreiber students will be on a hybrid instructional model. And at the elementary, we're bringing all of our kids back to school. So I want to be very clear about what it means when you do bring all your students back. And as a parent myself, I understand there are pros and cons to both, right? So do you, do, when all the students come back, there, there has to be some concessions in some way. It's, and we have to understand that, you know, in order for us to comply with the safety precautions, that the classroom, the school building, it's, it's just going to look different. It's going to feel different. It's not going to look like it did pre-March or on the first day of school last September. So in many cases, actually in all cases, there are no rugs, lots of materials have to leave the room in order to make space available. Um, so we're moving a lot of things out of the classrooms to maximize the number of students we can fit within each classroom. And listen, we're trying not to make it look sterile, you know, like a hospital, but in many ways, in order for us, again, to bring everybody back, we, we have to move a lot of furniture and a lot of things out. And each school building will have a number of pods outside to store a lot of the furniture. And as you know, the desks will be six feet apart from each other. Kids or students won't be able to move much. So they will be staying in one classroom, um, except when they have recess or they go on mask breaks. And the teachers, you know, unfortunately, under these conditions, it's going to be very difficult because you can't get too close to the kids. Now, I'm sure many of you who have young kids like I do and old kids well, like I do, um, it's it's very, and I used this word before, counterintuitive for a five or a six year old to not get close to somebody. It's it's part of their DNA. And so there, there will be a lot of work. And I'm hoping you can be part of this work with us to talk about the importance of making sure our kids do stay socially distant. We have to split classes in half in many cases. Because in, if you look at a classroom, we're talking about maybe 14 kids in a class. So what does that mean? Right. And then we're also talk, talking about maximizing and using spaces within our school building 
that we typically wouldn't use for instructional purposes, such as a gym or a cafeteria or other spaces that were usually relegated for something else um, or now will be used as classroom space. The secondary, well, I'll, I'll talk about the secondary realities later because we're still focusing on elementary, but this is what it's going to look like. Now, the one-on-one -on -one in initiative means that every student will have uh, either a Chromebook or they'll have an iPad. For K through two students, they will have an iPad and they will have internet access. Um, if, if you don't have it at home, we will help you uh, do that because clearly if in a hybrid model and if we have to go to fully remote, we wanna make sure that you have access to everything that we're doing. So in grades two through five, um, actually you should say three through five, um, we're going to supply students with a Chromebook for home instruction. So they will have a Chromebook and um, they will be able to access lessons and everything else there. So I'm, I'm happy to report that. And that's something we work very hard to make sure that every, every, every student uh, has, has a, a device to use. Now, ancillary services like special education services as well and ENL and some specials, um, that's, that's taking place. Students will, as I said before, will be divided into small groups and socially distanced. Um, and we already talked about mask breaks and, and lunch and recess. And the schedules are currently being created separately in each building. So we will talk about that a little bit more. Hopefully we'll have an update um, on Monday when you join us for, for the Board of Education meeting. Now, if you look at the schedule, as far as what it looks like, uh, the school day, and this is just a sample schedule. For the most part, it looks the same as far as times are concerned, but you'll see there's an ELA block, a math block, um, mask breaks in between. You'll have a special, we'll have recess and lunch, more instruction in the afternoon, another mask break, and then we dismiss. If we look at, look at the middle school instruction and what Weber has to offer, where, as I said before, we're looking at a hybrid model. 50% in-person and 50% remote instruction four days a week. This is like an A-B schedule. So every student, like I said before, same in Weber, is provided a Chromebook for home and school instruction. Uh, we have two days of full in-school instruction for classes that meet every day and one day of full in-school instruction for classes that meet on alternate days. So, and you'll, you'll see a schedule after this slide, but really what it looks looks like is even when the students are home and remotely learning, they will still have direct instruction, which is something that the committee really focused on and, and, and was able to actually make, make happen, which I'm really happy about. And I'm sure our parents and students are as well. Um, and then finally, there's a Wednesday, the fifth day of the week, that's dedicated to very clear contact time, instructional time, um, not only are we focusing on mental health and the emotional needs, but also it's, it's dedicated for instruction and for actually focusing on not only small group instruction and or possibly used for large group instruction, but for project-based learning opportunities. And, and we'll talk more about that on Monday. So if you go to the next slide, we'll see a sample schedule. And, you know, I don't want to get too into the details there, but you can see, and, and again, this presentation will be posted um, on our website. Um, so you can, when you look through uh, the, the slides, you'll be able to see what the schedules look like. And you'll see that Wednesday, which was very important to, to the subcommittee. So again, it's, it's, there's instructional components there. There are social and emotional components that are there. That was the real, real charge of the school district. Yes, the, the, the instruction is very important, but the social and emotional needs, especially of our middle schoolers, um, is incredibly important and, and that's embedded and I'm thankful um, you get to see that. So now as we move on to Schreiber and we look at the hybrid model, again, just like um, just like uh, Weber, it's 50% in-person and 50% remote. Um, every student, again, at the high school will receive a Chromebook uh, for home and school instruction. We know Schreiber has um, an atypical kind of schedule when it looks when it's compared to other high schools. I, I love the fact that we have a six-day cycle where you have hour-long periods of instruction. 
I think it's very powerful. I think it's served a wonderful purpose for our students over the years. So we wanted to stay with that model. And so you'll see it's a six day, same A through F cycle in two groups, a blue and a white group. Um, and again, it's an AB schedule. Um, what's I think really powerful too, not only from an instructional component, but a, a, a connecting component is that assistant principals will host weekly check-ins check-in sessions with 10 students. Now, does that mean that 10 students are meeting with an assistant principal every, every week? Not necessarily, but they will be checking in often um, to see how our kids are. And um, we will go to the next slide and you will see um, the framework and a sample schedule of what it would look like for um, in-person instruction and what happens when uh, a student is learning remotely. When students are learning remotely, they will check in with the teachers. They will have um, asynchronous lessons, either pre-recorded lessons, uh, projects to work on, and certainly making sure that uh, the teacher contact uh, is in place. So for our special education students and our ENL students, our, you know, I, I always think this, and I'm, I'm hoping you agree, you know, in many cases, a school district really, they have to, then the way that we judge a school district is how do we, how do they take care of their most vulnerable populations? And when we focus on our special education and ENL students, you know, I'm happy to say when our students come back at the elementary level, all students, uh, both ENL and special education, uh, we'll attend Monday through Friday, as you know, and related services will be provided in person. And I want to be clear about this, too, when it comes to masks. So if a student is receiving speech services, um, they will have a mask. We will provide a mask. Or if you have a mask, if you're a parent listening to this, you know, where you can see their mouth, it's, it's a very important part of the speech process, clearly. Uh, and so, you know, we're we're trying to be as proactive, and we are being as proactive as we can to ensure that those type of instructional opportunities are there for our kids, our RISE kids, TLC kids, uh, will remain full-time in a hybrid model. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, will remain full-time in a hybrid model. So I want to make that clear distinction. If we do go to a hybrid at the elementary, if the governor says 50% capacity can only enter an elementary school or all schools, then still in a hybrid model, we would make sure that uh, our elementary uh, special education and ENL students are there. For middle school, for Weber, all students attend four days per week, virtual learning on Wednesdays, all related services will be provided in person. So that's, I'm, I'm happy to, to share that with you. And then of course at Triber, all students again, attending four days a week, following in-person schedules for classes, and again, all the related services provided in person. When we talk about our ENL kids, it's for our entering and emerging students. So for our medically fragile students, I know there's a lot of talk about um, having a virtual option for, for all students, right? But clearly in the guidance, the SED DOH guidance, it says per the state's requirements is, it will be determined by a case-by-case -case basis, the district will communicate individualized plans for eligible students in the coming weeks prior to the beginning of school. And what that really means is if there is a student who has you know medical documentation that they, they can't be in school then we will provide a remote option for them so that is again not only the right thing to do of course but it's something that our district takes very seriously and we want to uh, make sure that we provide that wonderful uh, education we just need to do it remotely and make that work now moving on to the next slide which i know i've received uh, many emails, and I know our Board of Education has as well, that for our non-medically fragile students, having a fully virtual option, there have been a lot of inquiries, you know, about why can't we have this option for all of our students? Because we have some parents who are reluctant to send their children back to school, understandably so, um, based on, you know, what they're, how they feel and what they're hearing about and what they're reading. So we, we heard you. We heard you and we will provide a full virtual learning platform. Um, this is something that our Board of Education was, to be honest with you, was felt very strongly about, um, to their credit. 
And so there are questions that, and some certain things that we have to work through in order to make that happen. But please know we will have this option for all students. So can students opt in and out of the platform? Meaning that if a student wants to, or if a parent wants their child to start virtually, can they, um, can they have them come back to school uh, in October, all right? Or vice versa, if a student is starting in school, can a student then, you know, in uh, November say, you know what, uh, we want, we want our, our child or children to, to go fully virtual. These are the things that we have to and we will uh, continue to figure out. How many students are interested? So that's part of uh, the survey. That's why it's incredibly important that if you are listening to this recording and or you listen to this presentation Monday, that you take that survey so we know how many students we're talking about. Uh, there will be some additional costs and staffing, um, staffing things that we need to consider. So we have to work through that. And of course, the technology piece. And, you know, we're hoping that New York State Education Department will provide further guidance. I wouldn't hold my breath too much <laughs> with that. But regardless, we're moving this forward. And as soon as we have information to share with you, we will share more. But I, I want to be crystal clear that we are providing this option for all students. Lots of questions as far as what's going to happen with athletics, music programs, and after school clubs. So as many of you know, especially if you have a child who plays sports um, for, uh, for a school district, um, everything's been postponed or delayed until September 21st. Um, we are awaiting further guidance and, and comment about what the fall season will look like. So we will, it's a wait and see right now. Our music programs, we are making every effort uh, to facilitate our music programs. Clearly, we, we know about the 12-foot 12, the 12 social distancing um, you know, uh, guidance as far as if, if a child is in chorus or if they're playing a woodwind instrument. Um, so we, are, we will come up and, and certainly make sure that we are very clear as far as what's happening with our music programs. We have so much pride in what we offer our kids. We know the importance of music and what it means to the lives and not only that, but brain development and everything else. So more to come as far as what our programs will look like. I know uh, Mr. Scully is, you know, um, really focused on making sure we provide as much as we can for our kids. After school clubs, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to say as of right now, no after school clubs um, as we're looking into the feasibility and we'll provide more information if anything changes. And again, I want everyone to understand this plan as we're talking about right now is fluid. Um, it can change. And as of right now, though, we are not having any after school clubs. So for visitors and events, um, it, it's strongly, we are strongly discouraging and limiting the number of people that, um, that enter our buildings. So, you know, again, a lot of this is so counterintuitive because in normal circumstances, clearly we want to invite the community and to see all the great things that we're doing. Um, and, uh, but right now we are strongly discouraging and limiting uh, as much as we can as far as people entering our buildings. And if they do, um, they will be screened. Um, so the, the same health screening that's required for all of our employees, everybody will have to do that. As far as events, all field trips, large group events, and community use of school facilities, they, you know, again, at this time, they are canceled until further notice. Um, this is, again, something that we take a lot of pride in, but we, safety comes first, and this is something that we're moving forward. As far as parent meetings, any meeting that we do have with our parents will be hosted virtually. So let me briefly just talk about the remote plans. If and when there is an emergency closing and all of our schools have to be closed and learning takes place remotely, now, again, all students will have a one-on-one -on -one device, um, which, I'm, again, I'm very thankful for. That was part of some of the issues that we were having uh, last spring. Um, so this is what will happen at the elementary level. There'll be um, there'll be a daily scheduled meeting uh, with with the classroom teacher, two 45-minute live sessions per day to work on to to learn about different content areas, um, most notably ELA and math. One asynchronous lesson per day. Um, so that could be a recording. That could be something um, that's a that's that's already pre-made that our students will be working on. 
a 30 uh, to 45 minute special per day. Um, so that's, we wanted, it's incredibly important that we have our special area teachers, music, art, physical education, uh, library, all those different things are so much a part of the educational experience for our kids. We want to keep that intact. So the, the schedule will have that every day and then two 10 minute live check-ins uh, per student per week. What's important about that is, you know, these live check-ins uh, with our kids to make sure everything is okay, um, to, you know, to speak very uh, clearly with, with our educators as far as the wants and needs of, of what's happening, if things have to be adjusted, you know, and that's the opportunity to do that. And within this day itself, too, you have to understand, then there's schoolwork to do. So this, these are the instructional parts. And then there's the schoolwork that the students or our children will be doing as well and trying to find a balance between what's, you know, what's what, what's not enough and what's too much. And so we, we want to thank the uh, elementary committee for coming up uh, with this framework. So when we look at Weber and what that entails, we're looking at four days a week as uh, pretty much mirrors. Um, what the schedule looks like before. Instruction is organized into three one and a half hour blocks of live instruction. Periods one through three, as you can see, 30 minutes each. You have to have those breaks in there. For any of you who have spent a lot of time on either Zoom meetings or Google Meet meetings, those, those 20 minute break periods are golden. And so it gives students and staff uh, the opportunity to recalibrate, to, you know, to get centered again for, for the next lesson that's there. And you can see in periods four through six, uh, same thing, there's a 45 minute lunch break period seven through nine, again, 30 minutes as well. And the fifth day, as I said before, is not only reserved for additional contact time, small group instruction, um, large group instruction, possibly asynchronous learning, but also the mental health staff checking in with their kids as well. And then finally for Shriver, we're looking at if you have a, um, if your class is a two by six, a four by six, five by six, or even a six by six, it lays out there clearly what the sessions look like, um, both live um, and then recorded sessions. So you can see if it's two by six, it's one session of 30 minutes of live instruction for each class, and then uh, the other is recorded. And it's the same thing when you get to four, five, and six. So what are the protocols, if and when, we have to response to a positive COVID-19 case, right? So what does that look like? What is the school district required to do? What is it, you know, what are those protocols and procedures? And clearly student staff who test positive, um, immediately they, they are excluded from attending school. I mean, that's, that's pretty clear. We have to contact the Nassau County Department of Health. The school administrator will do that immediately. I can tell you, Dr. Allen, gosh, from March until June, uh, spoke to the Department of Health in Nassau County, probably more than anybody here in, in port. Um, but clearly we will report that uh, positive case and wait for their guidance as far as what we have to do. Um, communications, this is something again that we continue to work on and upgrade, but we will notify families and staff of any positive cases. We have to maintain confidentiality. And um, you know, again, all that have had close contact with a positive student or staff member, they need to stay home and self-monitor as well. That's why it's important for us to contact trace. Returning to school or work, you know, we talk about what the guidance is currently right now, what we have in front of us, it's 24 hours with no fever and symptoms. Um, and symptoms have improved in 10 days uh, since symptoms first appeared or 10 days after the first positive test. The student and staff member, again, must present documentation from their healthcare provider before they come back to school. So we need a medical you know, documentation saying that they are okay to come back to school, either as a student or a staff member. So professional development, um, this has been ongoing, not only over the summer. Um, speaking of the summer though, um, you know, as, as of not even to, to date, I know um, our, our teachers have been hard at work, over 150 teachers right now. They have either participated or are set to participate in, course, in, in uh, coursework with Google Classroom student engagement in virtual cl classrooms, looking at Nearpod and Pear Deck formative assessment tools. You know, assessment clearly is going to be incredibly important. We need to know where kids are when they first come back, identify where those gaps are, and then, you know, I know a lot of months 
you know, our kids haven't been here. So we have to look at regression and make sure that we bring them uh, as quickly as we can up to speed to where they need to be. Uh, looking at book creators, seesaw and boom cards and, and, a, and a whole much, a whole bunch more when it comes to professional development. Um, but when we talk about superintendent conference days, we're looking at Tuesday, September 1st, and then Wednesday, September 2nd. And I'm sure some of you are saying, well, how can that be? Because the first day of school is supposed to be September 2nd. So if you go to the next slide, um, you will see there's a new and a revised opening day of school. We, we are doing that for two reasons. It is incredibly important that our educators and our staff get reacclimated to the school building. Many have been back to our schools since March. It's a very long time. The, as I said before, the classroom space, the school itself will look very different. Um, it provides opportunities not only for that, but for more professional development for our students. I'm sorry, for our staff. Also, to understand the routines and the protocols for health and safety. So um, professional development th there as well. And then, of course, the opportunity for our, our administrators to meet with their staff to talk about expectations and just to become, you know, again, as I said before, reacclimated. So those two superintendent conference days are incredibly important two days before school, and then we talk about September 3rd as the new first day of school. Now, in addition to that, knowing that our, our youngsters who come in to, to class, we're looking at a phase-in model uh, for the opening day. So the rationale being is that, you know, to safely acclimate, <clears throat> excuse me, our elementary students and staff members to the new routines and procedures. So. Just like, you know, for professional for September 1st and 2nd for our staff to get reacclimated and to learn new protocols and procedures, we will take the time to do the same for our kids when we phase in reentry for our elementary kids. So it's time to practice fire drills, hallway and bathroom routines, lunch and recess routines, a lot, a lot of new routines that they have to learn and adjust to, mask breaks. Uh, arrival and dismissal uh, procedures because they will all be different. And again, this will also provide time for more teacher collaboration, which I can't underscore how important that is as we move forward. And, and again, more professional development and planning. Now, when we move to this slide here for reopening, there is a schedule that we're going to move. So we know, as I said before, professional development for two days for our staff on the 1st and the 2nd of September. We're going to phase in grades for uh, one and three, so first and third grade on Thursday, September 3rd. Those are the only two grades that will be in school. For the other grades that are not in school at that time, they will do the things I just talked about um, with getting um, getting their classrooms ready and professional professional development and procedures and so on. The following day on Friday, on September 4th, we're looking at just grades two and four coming to our elementary schools. So again, Thursday on September 3rd, just first and third grade. On Friday, September 4th, just second and fourth grade. And then finally, on Tuesday, because Monday is Labor Day, on Tuesday, our kindergarten and our fifth graders, our kindergartners and our fifth graders will come in. Um, just on Tuesday, and then all of the students return. All of our kids come back once we have that phase in model. They come back on uh, Wednesday, September 9th. Now, kindergarten, it was incredibly important for the elementary uh, principals and, and the educators that, you know, they start with that phase in day um, on Tuesday, and then everybody comes back. So, kindergarten isn't coming in the week before for a day. They're coming in on Tuesday, and then Everybody comes back on Wednesday. That, that continuity was, was really important. So, and again, principals and teachers will have the opportunity to create virtual back to school and transitional activities with all grade levels. And we will have an additional kindergarten orientation that will be held as well. So I'm really thankful um, that we are moving in this direction for our youngsters. And then of course, our pre-K families, our youngest kids will be provided a separate uh, phase in schedule as well. So next steps, and again, this is part of one of the first slides, is just to reiterate 
this is the timeline that we're looking at. I know the timeline's a little different in, in reality uh, because the board meeting was supposed to be tonight. We're moving that to Monday. But the link that you see on this slide, again, will be on our website tonight um, for you to take a survey and to ask questions that you may have uh, regarding uh, reentry. And uh, the results of the parent survey, again, we'll, we will have that um, for us and to share with the community on August 12th. And I hope you can join us at our virtual community town hall, which is um, on August 11th at 7 p.m. But most notably, uh, looking at you to, to join us on, on Monday um, for our Board of Education meeting and for us to present this presentation again. Now, you won't hear me the whole time at, uh, at the board meeting. We'll have Dr. Mioli talk about the instructional components. Uh, we'll have Dr. Shields talk about some of the protocols. Um, and also, um, Ms. Fennick and Ms. Callahan will talk about uh, transportation and the protocols that our employees, um, our educators and staff have to go through um, in order to, uh, to enter our buildings. So that is the last slide. I thank you for your time and attention um, during this presentation. I went way over, you know, I, I said a half hour. And that's never the case with me. My apologies if I went too long, but I wanted to be as comprehensive as I can. Um, in, in making sure this information was available to you. And again, to all the committee members who were part of uh, this creation of, of our plan that I'm very proud of, um, I wanna thank you once again for you taking the time to, uh, just the time that you put into this. And for everybody else, I thank you. Any questions you may have, um, again, use the survey and any questions for me in particular, you can always email me, email me. My email address is on our website. Thank you so much.